Uh, Saul, thank you for that generous welcome, and it's very good uh, to be with you all. And first of all, uh, huge congratulations to the community here for all that they have done alongside uh, Saul and, and Richard uh, in not only repairing uh, this church, but also um, setting it uh, in store for the future. Uh, and meanwhile, doing all sorts of other things as well. So the very creative uh, funding application you put in, which is really good to see come to fruition. And I think this date has been in my diary for about two years. So it's, it's lovely to have got here, um, not least because um, the Woodhouses who live here and were uh, very involved in the life of this church uh, often spoke to me about it uh, when I visited them and uh, how much they appreciate and love and devoted to this, this place. It's good to also welcome some visitors from Koblenz. Um, I think we've got seven visitors from Koblenz with us. Um, Koblenz is linked with Norwich and there's been a long historic partnership between uh, churches in Norwich and Koblenz. Uh, they came for supper last night at Bishop's house and I they, they forced me to get the malt whiskey out at the end of dinner. Uh, I think we had quite a good evening. But uh, it's very good to, to be with you. When I was appointed as lead bishop for the environment uh, by the Archbishops of, of Canterbury and York in 2021, I expressed that I would have um, three priorities. They were uh, to reach net zero by 2030, which was the very ambitious uh, goal of General Synod to enhance biodiversity on church land, which had really become uh, a second priority, the, the rather neglected cousin of the first. And the third was to look at how evangelism uh, could come from our work um, with the Church of England's Environment Programme, how what we were doing could encourage more people to a life of faith in Jesus Christ, to be linked more closely with the life of their uh, parish churches and to create the sense of community that will enable these beloved churches of ours in Norfolk and around the country uh, to not only survive, but to thrive uh, into the future. Um, so the original motion that came before uh, General Synod um, spoke about um, a number of different things, but uh, originally, the original motion that was brought was for the net zero goal by 2045. And that was amended on the floor of Synod in a quite um, passionate heart rather than head uh, debate uh, by Martin Gainsborough, who was then the, uh, the Bishop of Bristol's chaplain and Synod uh, voted in favour of it. I voted against that amendment because I thought that 2030 was impossible and it was not a costed um, option. I don't like voting for something that's not costed. But I then voted in favour of the uh, amended motion. Martin Gainsborough is now uh, a bishop in the Diocese of Southwark, uh, so I've um, recruited him to the National Environment Working Group because I say, you landed us in this problem, you can help to solve it. But I am actually grateful now on reflection for uh, this amendment, because I think if it had remained as 2045, we wouldn't be having this conference uh, or many other bits of work across the Church of England, because it, we would just see this as a problem to solve at some point in the future. What the 2030 um, target has done is really enhance um, not only the finance that's available for this work, but also build momentum. And you know, there's this conference here today on Thursday, I was in Birmingham uh, speaking at a church commissioners conference on their work around net zero. And there are hundreds of other su such things as this going on around the country because there is great momentum behind it. So why are we interested in this whole area as Christians? It is the fifth mark of mission uh, within the Anglican communion to strive to safeguard the integrity of creation and sustain the life of the earth. We're interested in it because God, uh, it's about God's world. It's about uh, the creation that God has created and entrusted to us as stewards of creation. 
It's also a global emergency. It's a threefold um, crisis we're facing in terms of the environment. There's the crisis of climate change, the crisis of biodiversity loss, and the crisis of pollution. And all of these three environmental crises are intricately interlinked. But they also impact, most of all, on the poorest people around the world. So this is a matter, uh, for Christians, of justice. Uh, the average Anglican around the world does not look like many of you. She is a black young woman under the age of 30. Uh, she is living on around about a dollar a day in a country that is uh, in conflict or has recently emerged, re emerged from conflict and is daily impacted by the in adverse impact of climate change. This is the context in which we are living and preaching the gospel. And the net uh, zero agenda, I believe, is an evangelistic opportunity. Because when you do surveys, and there's been repeated surveys, the Tear Fund one was probably the most recent one called Burning Down the House. Um, it found uh, the, that nine out of 10 uh, young people were concerned about the climate crisis. But only one out of 10 think that their local church is doing enough about it. I think this whole area is an area where we can engage with uh, the 98% of people in this diocese who don't go to church and encourage them into a journey of discipleship. It is the context in which we are living and preaching the gospel of Jesus. Um, so I think we can uh, grow the church whilst also reducing our, uh, the environmental footprint uh, of the church. And certainly young adults want uh, to join organizations that take environmental issues seriously. In I think about four weeks' time, I'm leading a group of young adults from the diocese to Tizé in France. Tizé is a religious community of about 100 monks, which gathers around it around five to 6,000 young people from across Europe um, uh, every week, uh, all through the summer. It's an extraordinary place for Bible study, for um, uh, seminars, for going to church uh, three times a day. Um, and uh, sitting for quite a chunk of that time in utter silence. And um, in the evenings, after evening prayer, there's an opportunity for young people to come and chat uh, to some of the brothers and others who are invited to listen. And last year, I, I spent three or four evenings listening to young adults, and I was struck by the number who spoke to me about the environmental crisis we face. They didn't know my, my role. Uh, they just knew I was a bishop. And uh, a number asking me for advice as to whether they should have children. The, the, the eco-anxiety is a huge thing amongst young adults and, and, and children as well. And part of our Christian discipleship is to see the interconnection of God's good creation that, that the whole of creation is interconnected and we are a part of creation, though often we think of ourselves as apart from creation. All things are created uh, through him. And there is a sense that we need to rediscover the reverence uh, for the earth, to seeing again that this is a limited, finite resource that we live on this single island planet home, and there is no planet B for us to move to. We need to be able to leave it in a better condition than we inherited it. And I'm <coughs> continually struck because uh, many of the studies now are sort of saying, uh, 50 years ago, there was this, and now there is that. You know, that is just a bit short of my own lifespan, that we've seen such a decline. Um, and such concerning uh, change. Ultimately, of course, the land is the Lord's and it needs Sabbath rest. <clears throat> and the gospel um, should be good news, not just for us, but for all of creation. And that's why this um, 
advocacy voice, this voice of protest at what we're seeing, is something that Christians can be and should be involved with. For we have sinned both individually, corporately, um, governmentally, through our greed and our exploitation uh, and, and our ever want for more. Daily we pray, don't we? Um, give us today our daily bread. We, we're praying in, that Lord, in the Lord's Prayer in that line for just what is sufficient, what is enough, rather than saying we want, uh, you know, a massive shed load of bread for, to store up for our own use. And of course, Jesus reminds us that it'll just go moldy. So how do we, um, all that we have, how do we share that so that we have sufficient enough rather than wanting more and more. We're called to be uh, stewards uh, of creation and to take this whole area uh, very importantly. Now, this quote that I'm going to read to you from the uh, environmentalist and lawyer Gus Speth, um, uh, I am a little bit concerned that it, it wasn't actually said by him. Uh, we're just trying to find out a little bit more about that because I have read in a couple of places that he didn't actually say this, but probably he should have said it because it's a very good quote. I used to think that top environmental problems were biodiversity loss, ecosystem collapse, and climate change. I thought that 30 years of good science could address these problems. I was wrong. The top environmental problems are selfishness, greed, and apathy. And to deal with these, we need a cultural and spiritual transformation. And we scientists don't know how to do that. The role of the church, and indeed all faith communities, around conveying how we might live well so that others might live too, um, is of vital importance. How we tread more gently on this earth is of vital importance uh, for us all. For the church is the living body of Christ, and uh, it's how Christ touches the earth now. So the church should be concerned with the things that Jesus is concerned about. And when you turn the pages of, of the Gospels, we keep encountering Jesus who counts the, the birds of the air, sees the lilies of the field, notices the trees that are fruitful and those that are not. Um, how do we almost have a spiritual revolution uh, as well as a net carbon revolution so that the two go very closely uh, together? I'm trying to connect with the computer. There we go. And one of the things that I'm repeatedly uh, saying is that I believe that seeking to heal our broken planet and tread more gently on it goes to the very heart of Christian discipleship. The debate is not a luxury for the ministry of the church. It's an imperative for the mission of God's church. So let's look at where we're at at the moment. Um, when you look at um, biodiversity loss, all of the statistics are incredibly concerning as to what we're losing around the world and in this country. Um, since 1970, the year I was born, global wildlife populations have declined by 69% on average. 69% in my lifetime. Worldwide, one million plants and animals are threatened with extinction. One to 2.5% of birds, mammals, amphibians, reptiles, and fish have already gone extinct. And extinctions are happening faster now than at any other period. So we can see um, here in this graph the, the deep red are the extinct and then critically endangered, endangered and vulnerable in those colors of sort of uh, red through to orange. Um, and you know, when you look at the percentage of the threatened of different types of, um, of our biodiversity, 
it is deeply concerning what we are on the brink of losing in terms of biodiversity loss or have already lost. And back in um, February, the Church of England passed a motion um, looking at the, uh, the land that we own and biodiversity loss, a land and nature motion. And we recognized in that that uh, you know, we've lost, for example, 97% of all wildflower meadows in this country since the interwar years. Um, we're losing um, huge numbers of species that are, the, the population sizes are reducing. Um, I saw, stopped to make a phone call on the way here and uh, there was a skylark overhead, which was such a joy uh, to watch it. Um, but 18% of our children are living uh, in the most deprived areas uh, where they never visit the natural world at all, see the natural environment around them. And the, the land and nature motion that I brought to Synod in February is an attempt to try to see the importance of biodiversity <clears throat> in churchyards and what a joy it was to come into this churchyard uh, today uh, in Glebeland, which is held by diocese, and then the national holdings of land, which is mostly in high quality agricultural land, land being prepared potentially for development and forestry, which is held by the church commissioners. So let's do climate science in five minutes. Are you up for that? So climate science, if I try just to explain in five minutes climate change to you, uh, I hope this will be of help for the context uh, of your day. So deep underground in the ice of Antarctica and Greenland, you can drill deep down into the, uh, the ice uh, there and pull out uh, cores of ice. And depending on the depth you're going down to, you can go deep back into history. And trapped in that ice are the tiniest bubbles of the air from that period, going back, uh, back through, you know, huge periods of time, um, sometimes as far as 750,000 years ago, to be able to tell through the analysis what the atmosphere was at that point. And the data that is um, developed from all of these ice cores and the analysis of them shows us an incredibly interesting pattern. Now, what do you see in this graph? Well, what we see um, is the carbon dioxide level in parts per million up the left-hand side. And across the bottom, uh, we, we see from 400,000 years ago right up to the current period. And what the wobbly line is showing us is the concentration of carbon dioxide in the Earth's atmosphere analyzed from these ice cores back through time. And what we see there is a graph that uh, starts high and goes low, goes up again, goes down again, goes up again, goes down again, goes up again, goes down, and then whoosh, goes up. What's happening there? Well, what's happening is that um, during periods of glaciation, such as the last ice age um, 20,000 years ago, the, the concentration of CO2 in the Earth's atmosphere is around about 180 parts per million. So you can see, you know, just before it goes really high, that was the last ice age. So the, the concentration in the Earth's atmosphere of CO2 is at around 180 parts per million. And in the interglacial periods, as, as, as the continents warm up, the concentration of the Earth's atmosphere goes up to about 280 parts per million. 
you able to, can you see that in terms of how that graph has through time uh, got, gone um, up, then down, up, down, between glacial periods. But what has then happened? As we came out of the last ice age, then from bound about 1850, the level of carbon dioxide in the Earth's atmosphere just kept going up beyond 280 parts per million. And from what had been a fairly stable climate, suddenly we find through the burning of fossil fuels, coal and oil and gas, prompted by the Industrial Revolution, that the levels of CO2 just kept soaring in the Earth's atmosphere. And now they've gone beyond 400 parts per million. The world has warmed by one degree centigrade on average um, since 1850. And never ever before in the record have we seen this change both in the parts per million or the fastness of the speed of this change. And what in a sense is happening is that we're unwittingly performing a dangerous experiment, um, an experiment that we shouldn't be undertaking. We don't know what will happen here, but all of the predictions of climate scientists and the International Panel on Climate Change is that we're reaching a potential tipping point. We know that there are more extreme weather events going on. Indeed, two years ago in Ash Hill, in this county, you know, a fire began burning down 12 houses. I went the following Sunday to lead worship in the parish church. And a couple of weeks ago, I went back to see the restoration of these homes. That probably just started that fire. It's an inconclusive fire brigade's report, but they think it probably started um, by a piece of glass, a bit of litter in a field that, uh, you know, the very hottest day of the year, and it sparked, started a fire, just as I remember as an eight-year-old Cub Scout had, having a magnifying glass trying to start fires. Well, this was probably just a piece of glass in the field, and from that, that huge destruction of that village uh, of Ash Hill that, that happened. And according to the uh, IPCC, um, you know, this is what, the, this is the classic sort of visual of what is, what is going on in terms of the average temperature uh, and the warming uh, that we see. The IPC, the International Panel on Climate Change, is saying that uh, our role in climate change is unequivocal, that every region on Earth is already affected, that our goal of limiting to 1.5 degrees increase is slipping away from us because we're not doing enough. That th these changes are irreversible for centuries. That every region on Earth will be impacted. But every little bit of action matters. And I think there's a great sort of sense of, of um, moral and thought um, leadership. The church has a very important part to play. So our net zero carbon program um, was uh, introduced um, within the Church of England, uh, agreed by General Synod in July 2022, and I worked with a fantastic group of people on preparing this plan. But it sets out a clear plan for how we can get to net zero within the Church of England. But it's also realistic. And it's saying, look, we need to be looking at where are our um, buildings that are the greatest emitters. Many of our small rural churches um, not only lock up huge amounts of carbon within them, but they're not great users and emitters of carbon either, because they might only be meeting uh, once a month or so for worship, that we need to be prioritizing um, and being really careful about our resources as we move forward. So within our, um, our churches, 
within the Church of England, um, we estimate that uh, across our churches, across our schools, across our church halls, our parsonages, our diocesan offices, and our cathedrals, that we're probably emitting between 411 and 415 thousand tons of CO2 equivalent, and that's across 32 different buildings, half of which are church buildings. And then that's broken down uh, through all the different sorts. That's the sort of baseline that we're working uh, from. So where are our emissions coming from? About half of our emissions come from our schools, about a quarter from our churches. 18% or so from our clergy housing. So this is the challenge that is before us as to how we respond um, uh, and where we particularly target uh, investment to reduce our carbon footprint. Work has already begun. This is uh, Gloucester Cathedral, which for some years now has had uh, solar panels uh, on its roof, and uh, we have been immensely grateful to the church commissioners who have identified 190 million between 2023 and 2031, so over that period, to invest in the Church of England's net zero programme. This is from historic endowments uh, of the Church of England, which is held in equities in land and forestry. Uh, and is, has been producing a very strong return. What we want to see is one-off investment in this transition to demonstrate leadership, to learn from each other of what um, has been happening, to work in partnerships with a whole range of other organisations, and I'm particularly pleased to see various organisations represented here today. Um, to integrate Net Zero, as I've already been speaking about, within the wider mission of God's church, and crucially, because 190 million only scratches the surface of the cost of this work, to be able to raise additional funding uh, so that we can move forward. That's probably a too detailed slide for you to read from where you're sitting, but it explains um, the, the, the three phases of this work, which we will evaluate at each phase. Uh, first of all, in this early first uh, three years into next year, um, we've been using £30 million to build capacity, um, staff in dioceses. It's great Ed Cottrell is here, uh, who is our, our new Net Zero Programme Manager, funded by the Church Commissioners in this diocese. Uh, how we've, we're doing some quick wins um, that we can do around this area. And, and create some demonstrator projects, and I'll speak about one uh, in a little while. So, in terms of our churches, um, what, it, what does a church that is trying to reach net zero, in a sense, uh, look like? What's, what are the, the key things? Well, there are six key principles um, towards a net zero church, and in a sense, uh, this church is beginning to demonstrate all of them, which is fantastic. First of all, that they're well maintained. It's amazing how a broken glass panel or drafty door can create um, so much more use of carbon in terms of heating. So when we've well-maintained our church buildings. That's part of the way uh, there. Uh, buying renewable energy uh, where we can, changing to um, LED lighting, and uh, goodness, we're starting to generate quite a lot of energy off the coast of Norfolk. Um, waste less. Um, generate more on site where we can, and then the final um, choice which I have some concerns around uh, offsetting the rest, but I see that offsetting as the last uh, resort. Here are some uh, examples of local churches working towards net zero. So on the left is Hethel, um, 
where they have installed air source heat pumps, um, four of them, and uh, you know, finding um, a, a great saving uh, on their heating bills and, uh, and using renewable electricity to operate them. Uh, St Andrews Congham has installed uh, new heaters and LED lights, uh, again, reducing the cost of their energy and reducing their use of carbon. Fantastic. Fantastic. Well, thank you. Brilliant. Well, that's an even better way to advocate it than me. And uh, I, I, I know those um, infrared sort of heaters. You feel as if you've been slightly toasted for the Sunday lunch uh, afterwards. Um, then we've done doing quite a lot of work around um, our match funding. Uh, looking at grant streams uh, to support parishes uh, and working with dioceses so that that uh, they can afford begin to afford uh, some of of this work and that the match funding from the church commissioners is often crucial for attracting in other funders every diocese in the church of england is now benefiting from net zero funding from the church commissioners now, demonstrator projects is also crucial, a range of different demonstrator projects from rural to urban to large civic churches, um, to churches on housing estates, to get a, a whole variety of different churches that can then be used um, to explain what they've been doing, share good practice, but above all, to encourage. And we're very lucky in this diocese um, that we have been uh, one of the dioceses that um, has a, a, a two demonstrator churches uh, and the work that's been going on there is now being shared and others are going to learn, often on a smaller scale, uh, what they too can do. And the Benefact Trust, which is connected with ecclesiastical insurance, which insures many of our buildings, has given 1.5 million of match funding into this project. So the one we have particularly that's been showcased recently is St. Peter Mancroft in Norwich, big uh, civic church, uh, and it's undergoing an incredible environmental transformation, replacing the entirety of their uh, interior lighting system, installing heat pumps, uh, batteries, and solar panels. Because of course, where this technology is particularly important is where a church is used all through the week, uh, particularly if you've got solar panels, so that the energy that's being generated is being used in a cafe or in other ways uh, in that church during the week. And this is uh, Ed Carter, the vicar, uh, very proud of his uh, solar panels being installed. And they are very up to, as part of their demonstrator status, they're very keen to have people go and have a look. Now, many of our rural churches will not be on this scale at all, but it gives you the art of the possible. The other really important thing, and our wonderful DAC, the Arson Advisory uh, Committee, and Nick Cannon, who looks after that work, you know, are really uh, behind this whole area, as has been the Chancellor of the diocese, which has really helped around some of the planning and consent and faculty issues that we face, particularly with our medieval buildings. And I was really intrigued by uh, what, I'm sorry, um, what David Etherington, the chancellor, um, said about the Peter Mancroft project. Let me read it to you. 
In reaching my decision, I recognise that the target of reaching net zero by 2030 will cause painful decisions to have to be made. In the short term and in the context of modifications to listed buildings, this may look like a battle between attempts to lessen, halt or reverse climate change on the one hand and the proper conserving of listed buildings on the other. A little thought shows that this is a fallacy. The effects of global warming are likely unchecked to lead to catastrophic climate change within perhaps a shorter time frame than we realize. Severe climate change has the potential to cause untold damage to listed buildings amongst other adverse effects. And should it lead to economic collapse as well, then the money will not be there to protect and maintain them in any reasonable condition. I, I've seen a, 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 the beginning of a sea change around faculty applications, listed building consent, engagement with local authority planners. That if we want our wonderful medieval buildings to function and to operate for lively, active Christian communities into the future, then these are some of the things that we're going to need to do and to, to look at how this can be done sensitively. Now, if King's College Chapel in Cambridge can get solar panels through on its roof, then there is so much opportunity for others. Um, we can be leading the way in this around heritage assets, other heritage assets beyond churches in our communities. So the match funding um, campaign that we've launched in eight dioceses, Norwich isn't one of those at the moment, I hope it will be soon, where we're giving pound for pound from church commissioners funding uh, towards local um, fundraising has really been an incredible boost and most of the churches that have been involved in this match funding uh, program have raised more money than they need and their ask um, and it's really galvanized uh, local communities so that we're experimenting with a number of different things at the moment to see what will work well we're also offering parish um, uh, energy audits to our highest emitting uh, churches, a fully funded energy audit, and then for other churches, a partially funded audit, and with some match funding again to help with small scale uh, implementation. All part of this sense of building momentum around our net zero journey. There's also a quick wins fund where we've, um, the church commissioners have given grants to dioceses to help with some of the, the different uh, ways in which we can continue on this journey. Often it, in some of our churches, the best solution is to heat the person rather than to heat the building. And um, some are experimenting uh, with heated um, seat pads. So you can feel nice and toasty. You pick up a heated seat pad and you can sit there or you can hug it and uh, feel really nice and warm and toasty because you're being heated rather than, often the case, the angels up in the ceiling uh, being heated. So there are these heated seat pads or the under pew uh, heating rails that some churches are also using. There's all sorts of new things that are coming onto the market and that you can get advice from the parish support team uh, about. Now, finally, uh, I just want to mention EcoChurch because our partners at Russia UK are just superb in what they uh, provide in terms of some of the resources for us on this environmental journey. And EcoChurch is a fantastic way in which your church congregation can assess how well it is, being done, it is, is, is working along uh, this journey. Who's already registered for Eco Church? Fantastic. Now look around you. Keep your hands up, please. Look around you, those who aren't registered for Eco Church, and spot somebody that you might go and have a chat to later today. And simply ask them, what's been the benefit of Eco Church? So you, all of you with your hands in the air, please be ambassadors for Eco Church today, and then we can increase the number of churches in this diocese that uh, are registered. I think 176 are registered at the moment. I'd love it if we could get near 100% of our churches registered. We've got a little way to go. We've um, 
uh, and what it does, uh, Eco Church, is to really help our congregations to think through how they can follow this uh, both net zero and biodiversity um, improvement uh, through the life of our churches and then through our individual Christian discipleship. So I, I don't know if there's somebody from St. Andrew's uh, in Holt here, but congratulations. Uh, I gather you've uh, got your Silver Eco Church Award. Well done. Um, so uh, I think there's now 22 silver award holders in the diocese, 67 uh, bronze holders. So Holt, now it's on to gold. Okay, you may be the first one to gold, which would be great. And uh, this diocese has just got its bronze um, Eco Diocese Award, thanks to the good work of Barbara in cajoling us all into action uh, for that, which is really good news. But I really commend Eco Church to you. So, to conclude, this is a really exciting opportunity, not just, as I said, for the mission of God's church, uh, the ministry of God's church, but for the mission of God's church as well. I think it will engage more people in our communities, in the life of our churches, make them more sustainable uh, for the future, and live out God's call to be wise stewards of his creation. There's all sorts of resources available uh, to you if you look on the Darson website, or Arosha UK, or Churches Count on Nature, which has been happening uh, during this last week, or Preaching for God's World, to give preachers um, uh, ideas for each Sunday of the year, how within our lectionary, we can speak more about God's creation. All sorts of opportunities. I hope you will embrace them with all your heart and mind and soul and strength so that this diocese and our beloved 658 churches can really be places where when people go by them, they think, ah, they're at the forefront of combating climate change, of seeking justice for the world's poorest people, and to celebrate and protect the rich biodiversity, which it's such a joy to live amongst and be part of. Thank you very much indeed.